So welcome everyone um, to this evening of the Israel Association of Writers in English. Uh, this is the last in our series of two Zoom events, not two events, Zoom events, um, as Corona, for us at least, has uh, hopefully come to an end, then uh, we will be meeting back in person. Um, so I, for the moment, this will be the last of our events that started exactly a year ago. Uh, every three weeks we had an event and going from strength to strength. And now we're going to finish with a big chord. Um, however, as we are all aware, things happened last week, last Thursday, last Lagba Omer, a day of, uh, of joy turned into a day of grieving, sadness and death. And there was a question whether we should even have this event, whether it's appropriate. And we decided that, um, that we should go on. But we need to keep that, that, that event, what happened we have to keep in mind. And how you do that, how we do that, I, I don't know. I'd like uh, just to be in silence for a few minutes before we start. And the order of the evening will be Karen, Alkali Good, um, reading a poem on, on memory and remembering. And then we'll move to our um, special guests from overseas, Barry Wallenstein and Eric Plax. And then to our much missed friend Toby King. And we'll end with uh, Mordechai Beck, our uh, local, um, what's the word, trompador, psalmist, um, will take us, take us back into the silence. So let's just, uh, I'd like just to be in silence for a few moments. So, Karen. Please tell us a little bit about where your poem came from. Um, I prefer to read it first, but I will okay. tell you one thing. One thing that is that is important for this background, that there was a there is a musical called The Fantastics, that begins with a song, uh, "Try to Remember," you know, "Try to Remember," a kind of September, um, and. That's the title of this poem, which is about memory and missed chances and the need for slichot. Uh, it's a, it was a poem that was written in July, August, before uh, before slichot, and uh, it has uh, in it all the elements of. Uh, of the religion, I think, that you need for that holiday and perhaps for this memorial. Try to remember. Some of you people don't know how easy it is to die. I've had friend after friend slip by me, sometimes when I wasn't even paying attention and we were in the middle of an argument. There was a guy named Steve years and years ago, a real queen in the old ways, almost unaware of it for a long time. And he and I had a falling out over some other guy both of us loved. And then he got leukemia, they say, before they even knew about AIDS. And all the time I was thinking he was on the stage playing off-Broadway, playing in the Fantastics. He was fighting for his life, and we never got to make up. You get in these fights with people you love and figure they'll come back into your life like a leitmotif. But maybe it's just that you wake up one night from a dream and wonder where they've gone to. Or you see someone on the street who looks just like they did 20 years ago. But it isn't them or their kid or some transformation after surgery. I want you to know I'm not complaining. 
it's kind of nice having a life so filled with feeling, even if it does mean loss. And I'm only human, so I keep on taking chances, making mistakes, and walking out on people I love I may never see again because I'm pissed or tired or have some other momentary commitment. And anyway, I know they're inside me because they keep waking me up at night. As one night, I will remind you in your dreams of how we had it and didn't have it. And maybe if you just said something. And I know that you want to know more about this poem because you said you were going to ask me questions. Uh, and, and you can see that I, I, I take this poem as if it something happened today. But you want to put on the video first and then talk to me? Uh, I had a band. Uh, yes. yes, speak. I had a band. It was a, uh, well, I had a few. I, I had done an album with Liz Magnus of jazz where, where we really worked together and planned and uh, did everything as in one piece. It was called uh, the song, the, the album was called, uh, I forgot, but we did an album, it was great. And I wanted to continue. I really wanted to continue with music. And I had other friends who wanted to continue with me. Uh, Ronen Shapiro, who, who, uh, who really is like something like uh, post Schoenberg. Uh, so no one wanted to listen to the words. They wanted to listen to his uh, uh, absolute messed up classical. And uh, we had a great time together and did a lot of performances. But then um, I was recorded by uh, uh, Moti Sharabani, who did an album of me uh, reading. And then he gave it to Roy Alconi and Roy Alconi wrote the music. And we did, we said, okay, this is fine. We'll do an album, but we should never have to appear on stage because it, it, I, I wasn't ready for that. It was rock. It was not, it was just not my, my genre. And of course, the week after that, Moti Shalbani put us on stage to open for Nikmat uh, Tractor in Balbi. And I had to get up in front of, uh, I don't know, hundreds of people and read. And it got into me. At first it was very scary, but it got really into me. I really enjoyed this whole idea. And we started doing different songs. And this, this was one of the different songs where we, it was all uh, uh, made up in front of the audience. We kind of jazzed together. Uh, we didn't, he didn't even know English well enough to really be able to go with it. He went with my voice. And, and what I learned from this was the, the importance of uh, the rhythm and the, the rhythm of music in poetry. And I learned so much about how to write poetry from working with Roy. And we kept adding on musicians. We finally wound up with a, a program on the Israel, uh, on the Israel Festival, I think, about 15 years ago. And we wound up uh, with another band. Then they said, well, your voice is not enough. We've got seven people here. Let's get a singer. So I became only the writer. And uh, every once in a while, I'd make an appearance, but I was very happy in the position of the writer, understanding the background, understanding where my voice is coming from, understanding what it means to use a voice in poetry. I talked too much, didn't I? No, that was fine, because <laughs> <laughs> this evening is about this synergy between word and rhyme and it's not about song 
song is something else. Uh, I remember Leonard Cohen in, in, in um, must have been the 70s when he first started becoming really famous, was interviewed and asked, uh, so how do you, you you're, you're now a famous poet, but you're also getting known as a songwriter. How do you decide between a poem and a song? So he says, well, those poems that are not very good, I turn into songs. <laughs> so I'm looking for the poem that stays poem, um, but then becomes added to with, with rhythm, with music, with music of the voice even. And, 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 and what changes? What, what, what changes for the, for the performer, for the listener, and for the work of art? Every, I think that every medium that's added, if it's done right, uh, it adds. I, I, I work with a lot with dancers um, and, and, and dancing uh, with the poem changed my, the way I read the poem the, uh, and, and the way I understood the poem because sometimes the music that you put in, even if it's background music, it changes the meaning. It, uh, it, it increases, it doubles the meaning. Uh, and I think that that's, I think that's the most exciting part about working with other media was that is the way you can expand your, the meaning of your poem. Uh, if Leonard Cohen said that he used the worst ones for songs, he was kidding, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but he did fit you know, very short phrases into uh, lines in a song because there's a difference between singing a song and doing what you have, what we're talking about tonight, uh, expressing the poetry and the music. There's a great difference. So let's let's hear it now. Some of the people don't know how easy it is to die. I've been friend after friend stood by me. Sometimes, well, I wasn't even paying attention, and we were in the middle of an argument. There was a guy named Steve, years and years ago. A real queen in the old ways. falling out over some other guy, both of us left. And then Kevin came here, yeah, they say, before they even know about AIDS. And all the time I was thinking he was on the stage, off Broadway, playing in the Fantastics. He was fighting for his life. And we never got to make a... You get in these fights with people you love and figure they'll come back into your life with a leap of teeth. But maybe just wake up one night and sleep a dream and wonder where they've gone to. Someone on the street who looks just like they did 20 years ago, but it isn't from whether it did or some transformation after the surgery. I want you to know I'm not complaining. It's kind of nice having your life still so filled with feeling, even if it does mean lost. I'm only human. on taking chances and making mistakes and walking out on people I love and may never see again because I'm pissed or tired or have some other momentary commitment. Anyway, I know 
mother inside me because they keep waking me up at night. Because one night I will remind you in your dreams of how we had it and didn't have it. And maybe if you just said something. Tell us the experience. Okay. I'm sorry we can't share it. The experience was, this particular song was done off the cuff, and it was done, I think it was the best uh, possible interpretation. I'm so sorry you're missing it. <laughs> it but, it, you know, we appeared in uh, uh, nightclubs primarily, music, the piano festival uh, in Tel Aviv, we did a lot of uh, a lot of uh, performances. He's gone out to do uh, films like, uh, well, first he works for the Camry, making the back the music for the Camry, and and uh, he, you know Fauda and things like that. So uh, these guys that I worked with turned out to be incredible professionals. Uh, I turned out to be a poet, the same kind of poet. <laughs> uh, and I think that everyone should try their experience of working with music. Uh, some people say they like to listen to music when they're writing, but I find that as an interference, as a kind of um, imposition on my writing. So, but it puts music in, I guess. Do, um, did you want to ask me something else, or does it, does anyone want to ask me something else? Because uh, you, some people here, like I think Rachel saw me. Uh, Rachel Uckel, I saw me in performance. Uh, other people did not, uh, and I would love to do it again, but you know, in an old age home. So let's move on, and if I can figure out why this went wrong, I will. But I did try. I will provide everybody with the link um, and uh, one minute. Michael? Yes. We can hear. We cannot see, but we can definitely hear. Well, some people said that they couldn't. Everyone can't. There was at least three of us who wrote on chat and others who spoke up that they couldn't hear. All right, fine. Let's not have a, an argument about it. Um, now let's move on, and I want to, uh, Shlomo, would you please introduce our guest for this evening? Okay. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Barry Wallenstein. Uh, actually, uh, Barry and I met, and in, in both, we're both New Yorkers, New York City, from New York City. Uh, we met uh, back in the 90s, I guess. Um, He's, uh, he's, he, he straddles two worlds. He straddles the world of poetry and the world of jazz, and, uh, which is interesting uh, for me because I don't, I, I don't have that musical component. Uh, he has a new book coming out. We just, we just learned the other, last week that he has a new book coming out from New York Quarterly. It's called It's About Time. It's, uh, he's also the author of 10 previous uh, poetry books, including uh, Time on the Move. He writes a lot about time, about jazz, about, uh, you know, uh, um, things that we will he will touch on this evening. He's also known for a book uh, that's uh, bilingual, English and French, uh, called Tony's Blues. That has got very has a very uh, big following over the years. Um, besides his ten books, and uh, he has eight recordings of his poetry with jazz. And uh, aside from that, he's, he's an academic for years. He was um, he's the emeritus uh, professor of. Uh, uh, literature and creative writing at City College in New York, and um, did a lot to for foster uh, uh, gatherings for young people and, and presenting their poetry. He's also an editor of American Book Review, so he has 
he, he comes to us with a lot of uh, background, a lot of a lot of years uh, as a writer, as a poet, and as a as a as a teacher of poetry. He's also worked for Eric Eric Plax uh, as as, as, a, as a jazz pianist, and uh, his, whose knowledge of jazz spans uh, the, the history history the history of jazz uh, to from from uh, traditional to improvisational uh, contemporary jazz. He's also been performing for uh, over the last 25 years or so, um, not just around he's uh, not just around New York uh, where he's hooked up with Barry. Uh, years ago, he created a 15-piece uh, 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 ensemble called the Shrine Big Band. He play, he's played in venues around and uh, all around New York or in London, in Moscow, Paris, even Tel Aviv. He's been in Israel before, uh, in, in, live, in person, not just on Zoom. Uh, in 2002, Eric and, uh, and his trio hooked up with Barry at the Cornel Cornelia Street Cafe, which is a, a famous uh, jazz a music plus a poetry venue. It's been for many years, one of the landmarks in New York. And they've been collabor collaborating ever since. So I guess that's uh, close to 20 years. And um, the, the, they, they're regular, they have a regular, uh, regular slot at the, uh, at, the, at the Cornelia Street Cafe. I believe every week still they're doing it. Although I don't know with Corona, Corona this last year. Uh, but they've, they've, they've performed together at clubs and universities and stadiums and uh, and now on, on Zoom. So uh, we look forward to hearing them together. Uh, Eric Plax and uh, Barry Wallenstein. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lomo. Welcome. <clears throat> okay, so let me put... Uh, mm -hmm. Can you hear us? Yes. Okay. The first one... <clears throat> called And Now for the Music. There's a so terrible rhythm bearing down. A boy with a drum and a permanent frown. A mask on the wall which won't go away. No matter where you move. No matter how you pray. Imagine wearing the mask that haunts you. So the devil floats up off the map of pride. The expensive coat, the five dollar shine. He walks and he talks to the beat of the drone. In the hands of the boy fashion, sweating, not yet done. He's average in the music, he's new and doesn't know this time what to do. But the devil does, and does his dance, and rhythmic jolts, and the cuts of chance. He forgets the boy who beat the drum in the last few hours of the blasted sun. Thus the world comes down at the end of the day, in the woods, the fields, where animals play, where men like tigers act like spiders, weaving about, breathing upon their ghost-like prey. Wow. <clears throat> So we'll just go ahead and maybe after a few, I'll stop to see if there are any comments or questions, Michael. Maybe just tell us how you got into this. And what I'd like you to do is to read your next poem and then add the music to it. And I'll take off the words so we can first hear the poem and then focus on the, on the combination. Very good. Okay. So the next one is called Eventually. Okay, just tell us how you got into this. How do I how did I get into this? Yeah. Uh, well, it's a long story. I'll make very I'll make very short. Uh, I studied at New York University before they had such things as creative writing 
workshops and so forth. Uh, but there was an extracurricular group that would meet and read poetry to each other. Uh, I was about 19, 20. And the leader of this group was a wonderful poet named Robert Hazel. Uh, and he invited me and two others to read in public at a place called Jim Paul Eiler Show Place in Greenwich Village. Without telling us that that was Mingus's workshop, Charles Mingus, the bass player. So he accompanied the three of us. And that was my first time reading in public and the first time being in the company of a jazz, of a jazz artist. Wow. And some years went by, I did not do it again until the early 70s. And since then, I've been working with wonderful, wonderful players uh, in, in New York and all around, all around, from Nigeria to South Africa to Paris. So hooking up with musicians has allowed me to bring my poetry to audiences that uh, traditionally poets don't read before. And that's been uh, energizing. So that's 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 my brief story of how I started having fun with the music. <clears throat> so I'll read this one by myself, and then we'll do it together. It's called "Eventually." Eventually, the friendship will clarify or die. The wound heal or fester. The loose tooth tighten or fall out. The falsehood reveal itself and the fabricator be put in chains. Eventually, the traffic will untie and the bumpers locked together will separate and the cars will hum along the freeway, free in their release all the way to Tuscaloosa. Eventually, the seas will rise higher, the stars come closer, and a new species, as full of accident as our own, will rise up to build and knock down things for a very long minute. Eventually, we'll slip out, dress like quality, and have a magic time in the coming months and our world impressed by the wake of our passage will whisper within itself maybe tonight eventually the friendship will clarify or die the wound heal or fester. The loose tooth tighten or fall out. The falsehood reveal itself. And the thief be put in chains. Eventually, the traffic will untie. And the bumpers locked together will separate, and the cars will hum along the freeway, free in their release, all the way to Tuscaloosa. Eventually, the seas will rise higher, the stars come closer. And a new species, as full of accident as our own, will rise up to build, knock down things, for a very long minute. Eventually, we'll ship out, dress like quality, and have a magic time in the coming months. And our 
world, impressed by the wake of our progress, will whisper within itself, how about tonight? Thank you. Did you arrange for the sirens? Is that is that part of uh, that, that was, uh, New York City? <laughs> All right, let me, let me put on the next one. One moment, please introduce the next one. It's called the Old Dancer. He's called the magic mover in the theater. And he's built that way, always. Photographs show him not yet bent, but on the way. Scratching his paint, trying to organize a new step for a new season. Meanwhile, or in between shows, is busy enough, wall building, weaving, corresponding with old lovers, whose flames burned and melted beside his quick step, his graceful inside turn. still sound in the music, ebullient, light of tread, and or sharp of accent, nail the moment. But there have been rumors enough to blemish his name, had the news caught on. Days and nights in his last lingering while. He's a five minute dancer at the Cold Spot Cafe. Whenever the audience is on nightly, right in step, twisting with the swirling skirts. Almost equal to every measure, adequate to nearly every swirl. Thank you, thank you. Michael, is the sound okay? It's very good. I mean, this everybody has to know. I mean, we've been on on Zoom now for over a year, and everybody knows that. Zoom is not built for music. It's built for talking. Um, it's not even built for showing uh, uh, YouTubes, but it's built for talking. And it's quite a challenge. They've, they've adjusted their algorithm to allow music to come through. And this is not like sitting in the nightclub, nightclub listening, to, um, <laughs> listening to both of you. Um, but I think that uh, everybody gets what you're trying to do here and, and what, you, what, what you're doing. This, this synergy, this one plus one equals much greater than two uh, of, the, of your voice, of your words, of, of, of the piano, of the notes, of Eric. Of, it, it's, uh, it's a great combination. Thank you very much. So the next one uh, is called Tony Visits Hotel Splendid. And I've written a, a longish series of poems about this character called Tony. And at the end of the series, he takes a break from everything and checks into this special hotel called Splendid. After a week with my arms around very little, nothing really to talk about. After my pet spider 
quit being a spider. I had a will to splurge. I moved into the hotel's plenty. The drinks at the lounge bar need neither mixer nor chaser. Tipping back and getting the glad eye. Conversation too goes down my brain. Faces moving in, personal, in the middle of time all at the Hotel Splendide. Speaking with a person named Randy, I remember how ill I felt one time, running to meet another Randy. Falling down on my way. The current Randy is my feel better mate. Lately met and smiling at the Hotel Splendide. Another character called him Joe told me about his wife of some 30 years and how his travels divided him, sometimes cornered him, but he never lost his memory, stopping off at the Hotel Splendid. They say if you stay a week and no one dies at the Hotel Splendid, topic itself never comes up, chances are you'll stay longer and lose your watchfulness, your bitterness. Myself, I scan the daily papers now, study first the box scores, then the obituaries. There's the need to know was one and lost off the grounds of Hotel Splendid. Who wouldn't give up love for the dream of being that way loved? The needed facts the ones that can't be fudged. Hotel Splendid come to on a whim gave me arm for and respite, not cold truths. I'm on my way home. Beautiful, Eric. Thank you very much. Have you ever played that in the Hotel Splendid? <laughs> no, no <laughs> but I, I did once check into a hotel with that name and gave the, the manager a recording uh, with, that, with that poem by the wonderful John Hicks playing piano. And uh, it took $2 off the bill. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe try again reading a poem, the next one, and then, okay. and then we'll listen to it. The next one is quite recent. It's called COVID Goes a, we a Weeding. <clears throat> First, I remove the elders, then the halt and the lame, then those in tents or huts, favelas, shanties, slums. I know my way around, and when the pruning's done, I'll vanish for a while and smile in my corner and allow the players back into their games. But then I'll return to do my duty to winnow the population, separate the mighty from the less so. There are still the young blades who cannot imagine my blades, the brave teens, toddlers in pink, my clipping shears go snip, snip.
COVID goes immediately. First, I remove the elders, then the halt and the lame, then those in tents or huts, favelas, shanties, slums. I know my way around, and when the pruning's done, I'll vanish for a while. Smile in my corner and allow the players come back in their games. And then I'll return to do my duty, winnow the population, separate the mighty from the less subtle. There are still the young blades who cannot imagine my blades. The brave teens, the toddlers in pain. My clipping shears go snip, 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 clink. That was really gruesome. <laughs> The next one is called Tomorrow. When that lovely word comes true, a shadow that fooled no one lifts, and we celebrate. The gold comes teeming. The morning stretch, a fresh mouth after the brush. For many, the first coffee or tea. And then adventure begins and proves the idea of tomorrow grander even than luck or love or holidays with no end of money. Without tomorrow, as idea or fact, no hook to hang anything, no pot to piss in, no pot, no gin, no kiss from mother, father, wife, or kids, the old friend who drops by, the new friend to embrace and discover her story. No taste on the tongue, no bitter aftertaste to spit, no failed memory, but to become one. Banish the thought that blocks the rhythm. Advancing age supports this pretense of wisdom.
Thank you, Eric Blacks. So the next one I wrote after my father died. It's called What's Was Was. I'm going to skip those two. Uh, my father had an expression that I had never heard before when I mentioned that his hair was thinning out. And he smiled and said, well, what's was, was. And I love that expression. And now it stands for more than just uh, a thinning paint. My father, no longer cold in his coffin, but returning to dust, as the coffin too will do in time, like to say in old age, with a thinned out smile, what's was, was. And it had a sweet ring when applied to a thing. The dishwasher done in finely and a replacement on its way. LP recording, now on digital, with auto gone to rust, the money down on the shiny one, a nasty remark, finally forgotten. What's was was? An old bird falling off its wing. Leaves of autumn. A tear that's dried. A full head of hair. Now thin to a shine. The body's waste. Flushed away as this music fades. Practice for the end that does not come. The music does not stop. <laughs> Thank you. Tell you. tell us about tell us about your new book. And, and I also saw you have the theme of time. Shlomo talked about it, the theme of time. Um, and here you're talking about your father's death, and none of us are getting any younger. And what is is, what was was. Tell me, tell us now about your poems no. of time. Uh, in the autumn of one's day, <laughs> in the autumn of one's days and nights, uh, that subject, I imagine, is inevitable. But I've been writing, it seems, all my life about the uh, that there's not enough time, and that has a persistent theme. Uh, I could make a, a little anthology of my own stuff from age 18 until now. Uh, and that, but of course it's, it has uh, sped up in the last few years. And you stop timing your poems a lot. Yeah, that's right. Like the bullet and right. the 9-11 right. poem. Yeah, yeah. 
So it's been a persistent theme and uh, the poems in this book represent the last five years of work, I guess. And, uh, and I, I have a new grandbaby, uh, my first grandchild. And the first poem in the book will be my grandfather poem. And it begins, you arrive just in time. <laughs> uh, she was a week or two late, but it was just in time. So uh, even that poem has that theme, just at the top. Otherwise, it's all about that experience. So yeah, I, I was kind of hoping the book would be out to hold it up today, but it, it'll be a little while longer. And with the COVID still, there are no public readings or anything. Uh, I'm not in any hurry for that book to appear. Next. How are we doing with time, Michael? Because I, I don't want to overdo. No, we're doing great. What's next? This next one is called Instructions, and it's also quite new. Left of company, check the mirror, tuck her up, and blush for shame before I come in to comment. Find a friend and climb the ladder. Look around and then come down. Scale the mountain without ropes. Return to the earth and don't say a word. Listen to me, a better angel. Your best bet in times of fury. Come winter and the first snow. Make a snowball. Tighten it icy hard. And let it melt in your hand. to your pricelessness, weak to your meager weight, squeeze what it is into a thimble, fondle, fondle your likeness to the worm. light to the nearest tree, see the next person seated on the branch, fly off together, over the lake's rim, land, and climb back to the branch alone and smile like a baby. Thank you. Let's do a little. Which, which one do you want to end with? Uh, let's end with. Um, Rabbits. Rabbits on castle grounds at Hawthornden. Tell us about that. Well, I had a residency at Hawthornden Castle, which is about 20 minutes out of uh, Edinburgh, June of 1997, something like that. Uh, and I was amazed at how many rabbits there were. So it came out of that. And also wanting to write a villanelle with all the wonderful repetitions of that form, that Provençal form. So this is called Rabbits on Castle Grounds. The place is mad with rabbits, far more are bought than sold. A man is tied to his habits. They clog up all the turrets, have trysts in every fold. The place is bad with rabbits. Strewn everywhere like addicts, one's bound to feed and hold. A man is tied to his habits. For years, his friends, the Cabots, have said, Go see, behold. The place is bad with rabbits, all chasing tabs to wear bits of textured fluff their bold.
Man is tied to his habits. He studies all their antics. He treats them like they go. The place is now with rabbits. The man is tied to his habits. That's it. Thank you very much. Please, everyone, go off mute. Go off mute and give a round of applause. Everybody, go off mute. Eric, thank you so much. Diary, thank you so much. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much for allowing us to do this. Oh, pleasure, pleasure. Um, okay, that's. Uh, <laughs> There'll be questions uh, maybe coming in, okay? I, I have a question, let me ask you this. How has this um, evolved over time? How long, you've been doing this for a while, developing this style, how has it evolved? Uh, I've seen pictures of you with uh, double bass, uh, I've seen pictures, how, how has this, this art form evolved for you? Well, the happiest part of it for me is working regularly with a small group of musicians. Uh, I had a 12 years with the piano player John Hicks, 15 years working regularly with a wonderful saxophone player, Charles Tyler. I've been working with Eric Blacks for a good number of years. And so I like to have the, the more steady the relationship and the more opportunities we have to do it, the more successful I think is the uh, unity between my voice, the poetry, and the music. So that's that's how it is. Hmm. Perfect. Thank you so much. Right. Let's move to something completely different, as, uh, as they would want to say in England, and now for something completely different. I'm very happy to welcome back even though she's not here in the country itself. <laughs> Welcome back to the Israel Association of Writers in English, Toby King, who brings a different kind of song and a different type of rhythm to her poetry. Hi. Uh, thank you, Michael, and thank you, everyone, and especially thank you, Barry, for just incredible, incredible poetry. Um, just dive right into it. This first piece, um, I wrote it uh, following an, an incident uh, at a Limud conference a number of years ago. And it's a bit about that, but it's mostly about my own journey uh, back to Judaism and back to myself. Um, and it's called Coming In Through the Window. The man across from me says, there's no room for you here. The man across from me in the most bizarre attempt to show that he is on my side I have ever seen says, they locked the doors and nobody wants you here. I'm in a chavruta, a partnership of learning with another young woman and this man who walked into the room, a stubborn atheist. The kind who needs you to know that they are, that they are right, and you are wrong. We are mulling over a line of text whose English mistranslation reads, teach your sons. Your sons. I'm trying to explain how Hebrew, being a complex and fluid language, being a binarily gendered language with a strong preference for the masculine in the plural sense, and in other senses as well, actually leaves room for the presence of the feminine, that plural children male doesn't exempt the female or the other or the undisclosed, that there is room here. The other young woman nods along. She has found this way in as well. We are ready to move on. We want to talk about the Jewish value of education. We want to talk about what's worth passing on. We want to talk about the pressures and joys of feeling your ancestors at your back, but he, he's not ready for that. He keeps wanting to let us know that there's no room for us here. He wants to make sure we understand that the door is locked. He, who is waltzed in and out at his leisure, can't understand why we want in when the door has been shut in our faces. And then... 
because we truly live in bizarro world, me and this other young woman end up arguing that the text isn't sexist, really. And we never have time to discuss education and what's worth passing on and the pressures and joys of feeling your ancestors at your back, but the text isn't sexist isn't what I wanted to say. What I wanted to say was that I know very well that the door is locked because I've spent most of my life alternating between banging on it frantically and playing sour grapes with the sacred contents. What I wanted to say is that if you keep insisting that there's no way in and no space to be made, how are you any better than the people who lock the damn door in the first place? What I wish I had said was I know the door is locked, but I'm coming in through the window anyways. I know the door is locked, but me and this other young woman are coming in through the window anyways. Me and many other young women are coming in through the window anyways. Me and my queer siblings have come in through the window anyways, and we're here now. And we always have been, really. We're here now, and wow, <laughs> look at all this room. We're here now, and we might redecorate a bit. And we're here now, and we wanna talk about education and what's worth passing on and the pressures and joys of feeling your ancestors at your back, we're here now. And we're unlocking the fucking door. Um, Take a breath. <laughs> this, Eric, uh, Eric, can you can you hear the music? I can hear Eric playing, <laughs> playing to your words and bringing the rhythm out higher and higher. I can hear it, magnificent. Um, my second piece is is a bit more er experimental than my usual fare. Uh, I kind of made it by taking a piece of Rashi that uh, me and my Chavritza at the time were sort of banging our heads against and just giving up and uh, running it through Google Translate. Um, and it came out with some interesting results and I played around with the what the result was for a little bit and came to this. Uh, it's called Mother Tongue. You cannot interpret the mother tongue to say, and you will not be afraid of them. If you do not say, you will be afraid of them. It is neither true nor in the language, but what is required is paranormal. To say you won't say yes, and puzzling is required. That is, that you will say in your heart, many of these Gentiles and will look away from them. Say we will not align, even though I answered. All of them are needed in the language of the theme. Gone is the end of your teaching, lest you say yes. And another is used in the language that is either or against, that is to give a sense to settle something above. As he will see, why you sit alone, because the people will come to me, that the people came to me, and because it is Moses, the man, that I said, lest you rob your daughters. Because I said, only God-fearing. They are all needed, as they are from. And also that Aaron, according to the sermon demanded by the wise because of his death, the cloud goes away. And all of them translate to him Aryan language. In Aramaic, all the tongues that are in my past, and if you come to change it, you have to change, all according to his interest, that you will come to the land because the horse came, because you breed, and breed in Israel. They are all tongue in cheek. They are resolved in the Sifra Midrash. And Sifri did this mitzvah for her to enter to a land of inheritance that you will inherit. That is, because they will bring you. And when you come to the land, you need these and that. The Pharaoh and horse came, because the Pharaoh and horse came, and therefore you took Miriam and God and all such as those that you cannot solve in my tongue and resolve when tongue, as your sons will say to you, because they will have nothing. They are all tongues, if they are.
I think we need a Rashi to translate that. I'm always, I get very frustrated with Rashi translations. He sometimes throws French in when you least expect it. And it's like, oh, now I'm dealing with French now. Thought I was dealing with medieval Hebrew and now we have French. It's very frustrating. Um, this last piece is a, is a shorter one um, and it's just titled Inani. Hineni, my Jewish soul, my Jewish self. Hineni, my queer soul, my queer self. Here I am, inextractable, indivisible, compatible, unflappable. Hineni, queer and Jewish and proud. Hineni, my body too big, too small, my body dysfunctional, my stomach indigestible, my brain a chemical compound not balanced quite right inextractable from Jewish because my brain chemicals may be fucked up, but they're inclined to fuck upness because the Goyim came and burned my grandmother's grandmother's village down. Inextractable from queer because my gender non-conforming boundary pushing self had me ostracized, pushed the inclination to the clinical, yet here I am, proud, not my struggles, but my joy. Hinani ki la, hinani ava, hinani levi, hinani as we all are, desperately trying to exist outside myself to fully understand the other hinani as we all are unable but trying anyways here i am connected through movement through friends through action and ritual and history through blood and tears and the swing of my hips to song hinani my body myself my community here i am i am ready in any. Please, everyone, go off mute. Give a round of applause. Wow. Very musical. Wow. <laughs> Does any, anyone want to ask Toby a question? <laughs> anyone dare ask Toby a question? Yeah, me. Um, you were talking about um, not letting you in. I'm talking about the previous one where you felt like it's, it's actually quite amazing to feel like a, a, as a young woman, you are really pushing your way forward. Is this because you feel like you're not being let in really? Or is it, how do you feel about all this? Um, I certainly feel that there were and are uh, Jewish spaces that, if not, I mean, physically letting me in, but also just not actually being welcoming to young women's voices, to queer voices, to other marginalized voices. I, I'm happy to say that I, I, I see that changing. And it's the thing is, it's changing from the margins, not from the center. Um, it's, it's people with marginalized experiences and identities in who, within the Jewish people and within the Jewish community who are creating their own centers and are creating their own spaces. Um, and uh, I think that's just truly really beautiful. I'm thinking about Tzfara, a wonderful queer Talmud learning organization. I'm thinking about, um, I'm trying to remember the name so I don't get it wrong. I think it's called Amuda, a very recent organization for Jews of color to learn Torah together. Um, th those spaces are opening up and there is room and there's always been room. And, I, have to, uh, I have to say that it echoed a lot of things that I felt along the years. And I'm very happy to, to hear somebody like you actually breaking through and pushing forward. And yeah, and it's nice to know that uh, we can trust your generation to, to do this. We're doing it. We are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, Nene. Hey, Nene. 
Okay. Toby, any last words? Um, I just uh, to answer Anne's question somewhere in the chat earlier. Yes, I did read that first poem. Um, happened, but uh, I thought <laughs> well, so. I thought so. I remember that it was all the way at the end, and you asked Reuven, "Can we come up and read something?" There was a there was another group else? of young women there, a little younger than me, who were actually there on like a on a seminary year, and yeah. they actually went up asked and asked first. They were my nachshon there, and uh, I was I was happy to join them. And then you just yeah, came Shlomo up Michael and blasted and I were away. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And it was great. I recognized that poem, and I was really happy to hear it again, Toby. Great poem. Tell us a little bit so about style. Tell us about the style, this um, spoken word style. I mean, yeah, I, I would just call it spoken word or maybe slam. I, It's just something I've been attracted to. Uh, I, I mean, I'm... I'm a theater kid. <laughs> you can tell from the projection of my voice. Um, so I, I'm interested in story in any format, and I'm interested in dramatics. Uh, so spoken words, a format that's always just sort of spoken to me. <laughs> and uh, I've always been interested in it. And the I don't know, the rhythm of it makes sense to me. Thank you. Toby, until next time, look after yourself. Thank you so much. I'd like to turn to Mordechai Beck. Mordechai and I go back 45 years or more. Not from England, but from, from Israel we met first time. And he's this anchor in our community. In, in art, in poetry, in music, in teaching Torah, in Talmud, in wisdom, in saging, in aging. So I want to hand it over to you now. All those people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, well, um, I didn't write any of the following songs. I left those to my my superiors, um, um, but the truth is, in um, in our tradition, um, Jewish words have always been connected to music, and um, it's it's quite extraordinary. For example, with the Zimirot on Shabbat. Uh, I've, I've always asked around to figure out where did it come from and so far I haven't received a proper answer but the fact is that we are unique in that that we have these beautiful zmirot uh, to accompany our Shabbat um, so we'll, uh, we'll sing one of them afterwards um, but the first one I wanted to sing is the Chadodi, which, which, which was, although it was written in the 16th century by Shlomo Alkabetz in Svat, uh, was given uh, any number of tunes, depending on where people sang it and where people prayed it on Friday night. Um, so you might get the Chadodi that comes from the Yemen. We might get one from Syria or from Egypt or from Poland or from Russia. And this is from England. Well, from Israel, but via England. <laughs> Shabbat Shalom. 
a time that it was never sung just read as a poem I mean it's difficult to imagine uh, yeah. if, you know Friday night you just read the poem right I doubt it I, I've got an idea that these the guys in Svart were very musical and um, the, the poem scans very well and it can be fitted to any sort of uh, community in every style that you like, Svadi, Ashkenazi, Hasidic, modern, and so on. Um, my own background, as far as music is concerned, is probably English and American uh, folk music, which I really liked, and I, I've tried to integrate the two into uh, many of the songs that I've uh, put to uh, music. Um, this is the next one, which uh, we say when we come back from Beth Knesset, if we go. Um, this is to <clears throat> welcome the angels who are uh, waiting to accompany us uh, to Shabbat. Shalom, my 
compositions and um, this is a very beautiful composition that um, talks of the Lachib that accompany us during the week and the special Malach or Malachim who accompany us during Shabbat. Like the one that just came in behind you. Right. Exactly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm Malach. But, what, but the um, music, the music is your own composition. Yeah. Wow, it sounds like English ballad. Well, it should do. Because it's probably <laughs> taken it's probably somewhere in my unconscious. There's an English ballad here hanging around there. Give us the last one now. Okay. Um, this last one is someone, one of my friends once called it his favorite, uh, his favorite psalm. Um, because it always suggests that you've just had a very good meal and uh, this is what you, you see after it. It's a uh, shot. Also, uh, this is a, a, a psalm as well, but it can be sung to any number of, uh, of uh, tunes. This happens to be mine, but there's 101 other tunes um, that uh, that we sing this to. Yeah. Um. 
Please go off mute. <laughs> wow, thank you so much. It actually worked. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's great. We could hear you. Very moving, beautiful, Mordechai. Thanks. Uh, well, thank you very much for everything. And uh, especially Shlomo, who introduced me to this. Uh, I thank you and everybody who's there. And I look forward, Karen, to seeing you when you come to New York next. We're doing a show together, right? Yes. And we welcome you to Israel. You'll do a show with us. I've never been there, and I would love to go. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> so, everybody, I'd like... Um, Turn off, turn off mute or go on to sound and please give everybody a blessing. Just say it all at the same time. Just give everybody a blessing. Bless you all. Keep your voice loud and clear. Keep singing and writing and sharing. Thank you. 